originally from, uh, grew up in New Jersey, and uh, you wonder what uh, what possessed an urban person to uh, find Purdue. Uh, it turns out that uh, we had one of the first natural resource environmental science programs in the country. And Eileen was attracted to that as a high school senior, and uh, because of her interest in the environment, and uh, on a whim, she happened to take uh, a soil science elective. And the rest, as we say, is history. She got a master's uh, here at Purdue and then uh, decided that she needed a little broadening, not too much. We didn't want her away too long. So she went up and got a PhD at Wisconsin, not long enough that she was too influenced by those folks. And so came back here and got started and filled a role that many of you, well, some of you will remember Helmut Conkey. If you remember Helmut, Helmut worked in this area of soil physics and it was really applied soil physics. I mean, she's fully capable of doing differential equations, I'm sure, uh, but that is not all that she does. It, uh, and, and so you'll find a lot of very practical environmental improvements in what Eileen has done. So we're real proud of her as a graduate and uh, now a whale of a contributor to our agronomy department. So Eileen, give them both barrels. Okay. Is this on? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Gary and Diane and uh, all of you for, for having me here today. Um, this is a really happy group, so hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll be fitting your happy mode here. But um, all right, so what I'm going to do today is talk about one of my current favorite topics, which is uh, soil health. Uh, what is it, and how do we go about improving that? <clears throat> so I want to start out with a little bit of a, a definition. Uh, people talk about soil health with uh, sometimes not a very clear definition. I'm going to just start out by saying I'm going to use the one that's a uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, uses, because I think it's uh, a very good one. Um, and it's basically the capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem uh, that sustains plants and animals and humans. So some of you may not have thought about the fact that we ask our soil to perform a lot of functions for us. Right? The main function that most of us are interested in is growing our food, but we also ask it to perform functions like filtering contaminants. If you have a septic system, uh, we ask it to, to uh, uh, basically keep our planet green. We ask the soil to do a lot of different things. Really here what we're focusing on is that um, use of the soil as a living ecosystem that sustains us and the, the uh, food that we, that we need to eat. So our overall goal that many of us are working towards, uh, whether in research or extension or practice, farmers in the field, is first of all to conserve soil um, for long-term uh, productivity, uh, to improve crop productivity, and basically to improve the, our system's ability to withstand stresses due to weather and climate, so resilience to uh, climate variations or weather variations. And this spring, we certainly had another example of where we need to improve our soils. That would not have stopped the rain, but it might have made a few of those fields a little more able to withstand those difficult conditions. We're also trying to improve water quality by improving soil health. And certainly, uh, if we want farmers to farm, uh, looking at the economics and the profit profitability is part of what we want. So some of you old timers though might be going, yeah, okay, is this really anything new? We've been talking about soils for a long time, right, if you're in this circle. Um, and so I would say yes and no. Um, certainly uh, good soil conservation and good stewardship has been something that, that people have been interested in for generations, right? So that part isn't new. Um, but I would uh, suggest to you that starting in about the 60s, there was a lot less attention paid to the soil as, as a whole because of the miracles of chemistry. Some of you may remember, uh, I, I remember as a kid, commercials in the 60s about the miracles of chemistry, okay? It was probably Dow or DuPont or somebody who had that at the time. Uh, but with the miracles of chemistry and genetics and large machinery that really started coming in in the, in the 60s, 
uh, the underlying soil conditions were forgotten about because they were masked because there was such improvements in productivity from those other technologies. Those other technologies have been good, uh, but they masked that soil problem. Also, because of specialization that came in in the 60s, there was a loss of those mixed small farms that had rotations with hay crops and pasture and so on. So many farmers no longer grew forages, and that also helped with the deterioration of the soil. So what we're really talking about now, let me just uh, propose that we're talking about a more modern version of, of soil health. Um, and there's been a lot of renewed attention paid to this, this whole um, idea of keeping our soils in good condition as a way of sustaining crop production over the long term. Um, we need improved soil health in order to harness the full potential of all those other technologies. Um, I love it when I hear a crop breeder talk about, well, you know, I'm doing all this great genetics, but it's not going to do any good unless the soil is also improved and, and maintained and sustained. So I think that's very important. Again, resilience to climate stresses is part of what we're looking at. And the other part that I would say is new is that last point there. We're focusing on the integration of soil biology, which had been forgotten, and soil chemistry fertility, which is everything that everybody knows about. Um, and also soil physical properties, but we're looking at integrating all three of those, and that's part of what is, is new. So really trying to look at the system, which is of course what a farmer does all the time, but they may not always be thinking directly about the biology part of it. So some of you know that I have worked on earthworms uh, during my time here at Purdue, and one of the ways we think about earthworms is they're ecosystem engineers. They build tunnels and they, they form structures and so they really have a lot to do with our uh, soil improvement. So that's one part of the soil biology, but not nearly everything. Uh, National Geographic about once a decade does an article about the soil and I really liked this picture that was in one of those articles. Uh, just to again point out that there are lots of different organisms living in the soil. Um, with soil health, we're not really talking about the big guys, the vertebrates there, but we are talking about earthworms and, and everything that is uh, smaller than, than earthworms, right? So all of these, um, all of those other little organisms uh, that contribute to cycling nutrients, who eats who, who protects who against who, um, all of those kinds of uh, transformations are really important. So a lot more attention paid to biology now than, than what we've had lately. So, of course, somebody always wants to know, well, how do I get this thing called soil health? What do I do? And of course, we can't give an exact prescription to anybody, but what we can do is talk about some of the principles that help build that soil health. And then on any particular field, we could get into more detail about, okay, spe specifically on this field and this climate, what might you do? So again, the, the uh, NRCS, um, uses this diagram to kind of illustrate those different principles. Um, so if we start up on the right, uh, top right, minimizing disturbance is one of the principles for improving soil health. No-till is one way that you could do that, okay? Um, then we circle around clockwise, maximizing soil cover. No-till is one way to do that. Cover crops is another way to do that. That protects the soil, so both of those two Principles are protecting the soil, protecting the habitat of the organisms, and protecting the soil against physical disruption, a physical breakdown by um, water and wind erosion, for example. Uh, then we continue around the circle there, maximizing biodiversity. That might be growing different plants besides our corn and soybeans. So for example, cover crops. Again, to feed different organisms and to help the ecology of the soil. And then the last one um, up there, provide continuous living roots. This is again also to feed the soil biology. They're hungry there in the soil, um, and by having things growing much longer than we normally do, we're feeding them and allowing them to do their job better. So if we think about those principles, then we can go anywhere across the country or the world and say, okay, in this climate, on this soil, how might we implement those principles um, in your cropping system. Just a quick slight aside, when I'm talking about soil health, sometimes people say, are you talking about making a Georgia soil into an Iowa soil? And I say, certainly not, okay? So I just wanna point out inherent quality versus dynamic quality. 
inherent quality is that aspect of soil that relates to its natural composition that has evolved over thousands, if not half a million years, right? It's influenced by the factors of soil formation, the parent material, the, the climate, the topography, how long has it been developing, and what organisms, both plants and animals, have been working on it. That's, that's a given, right? What we have here is what we have here. What we're interested here when we're talking about soil health is saying we can change the quality of that soil for better or worse, okay? So the dyna dynamic aspects, which are things that we can change as a result of soil use and management over human time scales of years to decades, okay? So that's really what we're focusing on is making these soils that we have here in Indiana as good as they can be uh, given how they were developed initially. So we're ter certainly not talking about a soil on the right that's the shallow to bedrock and converting it to a soil on the left that's deep, right? That, we have what we have. Now let's make the best use of what we have. All right, so I want to improve soil health. How do I do it and how do I measure it? How do I even know if I'm getting anywhere, okay? So uh, we have this nice little Venn diagram that says, well, we might need to measure physical aspects of the soil, chemical or fertility aspects of the soil, and biological aspects of the soil. Um, in organic matter, soil organic matter, that nice black, dark color that we have in our soils is in the center of all of that. How do we measure it? Well, we do fun things like this. These are some of the kinds of measurements that I've been involved with in, in my uh, research at Purdue. Uh, we have counted earthworms many times. Uh, my current students haven't had that thrill, and so I need to kind of get that back into the, into the program here. Um, we measure the rate that water flows into the soil uh, as an indicator of can that water get in so that the plants can later on use it. Uh, we measure with a penetrometer. We measure how hard the soil is or the resistance uh, to, to movement of a steel rod, which is somewhat simulating how hard it would be for a root to penetrate through the soil related to compaction and so on. So these are some of the physical property measurements that we make. Um, we also have, because there's been such an interest in soil health, there's, there are some commercially available soil health tests now. These are not things that we recommend uh, all across the state because they're very expensive and we don't actually know how to interpret them fully yet um, because the biology is very difficult. We can go out and count worms. That's relatively easy, tedious, but relatively easy. But how to measure all those other organisms in the soil, there are methods to do that, but how we interpret them and what, what actionable item we take as a result of knowing that we have um, 10,000 protozoa, um, I don't know what to do with that yet, right? People don't know, okay, well, so now tell me what to do next. So that's an area of active research, and Diane certainly worked on that a lot in her uh, career, is those kinds of measurements. This is one example of a commercially available soil uh, test. Um, and I know you can't read the things there. What I was trying to show is this Cornell soil health test on the, on the left. The pointer doesn't work with the, uh, with the screen like this. So um, on the very left, you've got three blue items, three green items, and three yellow items on the very left, which is basically saying they're measuring three physical properties, three biological properties, and three chemical properties. Because remember, we said all of those are important. So they measure those. They give you the actual measurement but then they rate it, okay? And you can see in the middle column there, you can see a couple of reds, those are bad. A couple of greens, those are really good, and then the yellows are somewhat in between. So it's kind of like going to the doctor and getting all the, all the blood work, right? You've got some areas where everything's really just uh, terrific, and then you've got other areas where maybe there's some concern and you need to do some uh, work on that, okay? So this is identifying for people what are some of the problem areas that would be nice to try to help build up, okay? So in this particular uh, example, one of them is aggregate stability. So the soil just kind of breaks down when water hits the soil. So what might you do about that? Well, you might grow a cover crop or you might do no-till or things like that. So, so there are these tests that are available and are becoming, well, people are still trying to find out how useful they are. All right, so how do we improve soil health? We find out a little bit about what it is, how we measure it, how do we actually go about improving it? Uh, three things that most of you will have heard about. Cover crops is one, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little more detail. 
Um, extended crop rotations, and we're not really talking super extended here. We're saying add wheat to a corn soybean rotation. That makes it a three year rotation instead of a two year rotation. But even that is a way of improving uh, soil health. Um, and then the, the last one um, is no-till, and of course we have quite a bit of no-till adopted in, the, in Indiana in the Midwest, uh, but not 100%. So no-till just keeping the soil covered and just opening up enough of a slot for the seed um, and leaving last year's residue um, there on the soil surface to protect against erosion. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about cover crops as just one tool for soil improvement. Um, is my, my current favorite tool, but it is just one tool among others, okay? So cover crops in the Midwest, a few of you might not be exactly sure what I mean by that. What are cover crops? They're crops grown to cover the soil, okay? Thus the name, between cash crops, so between our corn and soybeans, for example. Why are cover crops uh, interesting? Because there are many potential benefits. Soil health being one of them, crop productivity and water quality being others. Why doesn't everybody use them yet? They're such a good idea. Why isn't everybody doing it? I would have asked that question all the time when I was younger. Now I know better than to ask that question, but I still ask it. Why isn't everybody doing it? And what can we do? Yes, sir, you have something to tell me why? No, no. I was going to ask you, could you give me the names of some of the cover crops? I'm going to do that in about three slides. <laughs> Thank you. You will get them. Yes. Hairy vetch, cereal rye, uh, annual ryegrass, but I will show you some pictures in just a few slides. So why isn't everybody using them yet? Well, there are some risks and challenges. It does take time. There is a cost. Um, and there is a learning curve, okay? And, and no new idea gets adopted uh, in, in just a year or two. What's the rationale for the cover crop? And this is, I'd like you to think about this for just a moment. We're basically saying that we want to have a living and growing plant in the soil when we typically don't have a living and growing plant if all we're doing is growing corn and soybeans, okay? Um, why do we want a living growing plant? Because it's capturing sunlight, it's exuding carbon compounds out into the soil, it's feeding those soil organisms, it's recycling, trapping and recycling nutrients. So it's basically making better use of the time and resources that we have available. And it's mimicking, if you will, mimicking mother nature a little bit more. We, we typically have, um, if, if you're anywhere in nature, plants are growing most of the non-frozen part of the year, okay? In our corn and soybean fields, they're growing for four months. So we're kind of wasting a lot of time and opportunity. And so that's the, the rationale. Another way to look at that is to look at a picture. Okay, this was a Purdue agronomy farm, some corn and soybean uh, plots. Uh, this was an early harvest year, so this was early September. Corn and soybeans on the, on the left and right were harvested. Brown fields, brown all fall brown, white, or, or white all winter, brown until end of April. The grass strip in the middle of those plots, it wasn't even a cover crop, it's just the grass, uh, grass strip, green and growing all fall through mid-December, greening up again in mid-March in April. So during that time, it's trapping nutrients and recycling them and feeding soil organisms and improving the soil. But cover crops are part of a system um, there are different benefits and there are different challenges to each type of cover crop. Farmers do need to adapt their cropping system, including potentially how they manage their nutrients, how they manage their no-till or tillage system, uh, how they manage their crop rotation. And there is a learning curve and people need to do homework. And I tell this to my fellow researchers and extension folks and conservation staff that we all need to learn and do our homework and then help our clients or our customers, the people that we work with, help them with that learning curve as well. Because not everybody needs to make exactly the same mistakes, right? People can learn from other people's mistakes and what we've learned and can at least get a little bit further along um, and be more successful early on in the adoption process. There's a long list of benefits. This slide is simply to say we have a lot of different potential reasons to use cover crops, potential benefits of cover crops, maybe to scavenge or trap nitrogen that's left over from fertilizer, maybe to produce nitrogen if it's a legume. 
Reduced erosion is certainly a main, uh, main one. Improve that soil health, uh, trap and recycle nutrients, many different possible benefits. No one cover crop will do all of these things. So that's part of our job is to help folks choose the cover crops that fit their particular uh, reason for having them. But the bottom line one there, no matter what the particular interests are, everybody's pretty much also interested in improving crop yields over the long term, not necessarily in the first year, um, and then reducing that year-to-year -year variability in crop yields. So we want to encourage people to choose their cover crop for the main purpose that they have their first purpose, um, because no one cover crop does everything. Uh, but man, there's a lot of interesting cover crops out there. So, you know, where does a person start? All right, so what are some of the cover crops people are using? Three main categories of crops. The first are the grasses, which are the most common. Um, and so that might be oats and cereal rye and annual ryegrass. Those are the three that are commonly used uh, here in Indiana. Grasses, of course, as you know from your lawn, uh, the, the nice sod, the roots help aggregate and, and structure that soil, and they also help scavenge nutrients. So that's probably the most common type of cover crop that we have. Then we have brassicas. The daikon radish or oilseed radish is the current popular one. Um, and and you, can, you can see them there. Um, they're actually in Asian cuisine as a, as a radish that's eaten. Uh, we're not using them for that here. We're using them to scavenge nutrients. And you can see that, that um, there's a big root that goes at, uh, below that, that tuber. If you actually, here we, uh, one of my students was, we were just pulling these radishes out of a farmer's field and you know, a couple, couple of feet of that tap root going below it, right? So that channel can be really important for getting water down into the soil and for allowing next year's corn roots to grow in those channels. And then the last category are the legumes, which fix atmospheric nitrogen. Crimson clover and Austrian winter pea and hairy vetch are some of the more common. Red clover is another one. These, of course, would be, would be planted if you want to fix nitrogen and help replace some of your fertilizer nitrogen need because these plants are fixing it from the atmosphere and will leave that nitrogen for next year's crop. So those are the three main types of cover crops that people are using. Um, there are a lot of others that, that people are looking at as well, but those are the ones that we know more about and are more commonly used. So um, just a couple things to kind of summarize. We do have a lot of um, recommendations and guidance to help folks as they're adopting cover crops. Um, Purdue and the Midwest Cover Crops Council, and Purdue is the lead institution for the Midwest Cover Crops Council, which is across all uh, 12 states in the Midwest. Um, our latest project was what we're calling cover crop recipes uh, because we sometimes go to meetings, we often go to meetings, and some of the farmers will say, I really like this idea of cover crops, but I'm overwhelmed. There's too many decisions, too many choices, too much information, just tell me what to do. And I always resisted, because that's not my job is to tell a farmer what to do. But when enough of them say, just tell me what to do, then it's like, okay, so this project is to come up with recipes that help people get started in a low risk way, right? So we kind of said, here's what to do if this is your first time doing cover crops, here's what to do, pretty much step them through it. And the idea is for a lot of people, um, having um, a step-by-step -step approach when you're first learning something new is really very comforting, <laughs> right? And then after you get your feet wet and you kind of know a little bit more about it, well, then you can branch off and do wild and crazy things, right? Because you have a little more courage and a little more knowledge from which to do that courage, okay? So these are recipes. We have them for Indiana. We have them for um, uh, some of our other Midwest states and all the other states are working on them as part of our Midwest Cover Crops Council um, project. So, as it turns out, cereal rye, which is kind of boring, if you're into cover crops, it's kind of boring, but it's the one that is used the most often for very good reason, because it can be planted later than just about anything else. Um, it's the most winter hardy and most widely adaptable across broad regions of the country. So cereal rye is one that you will see used uh, very widely in, in our context, and that's one of the ones in our recipes. 
Okay. I'm ending with two slides that kind of point you to places to get more information if this has uh, intrigued you enough that you want to follow up on that. Uh, the one is uh, if you just Google NRCS Soil Health, that's the easiest way to find the national soil health page from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. They've got farmer testimonials, they've got interviews with scientists like me, they've got kids activities, they've got all kinds of different things on that particular site. Um, and then uh, the last uh, things that I'll point out are the Midwest Cover Crops Council, and I'm I'm very proud of that group because I was one of the founders. Okay, so I, that's a just that that lets you know uh, that the Midwest Cover Crops Council uh, has a lot of resources for the region, including those recipes. Uh, we have a a uh, best selling, I must say, uh, cover crops co pocket guide, um, which basically is for the whole region and goes through some of the common cover crops and some of their management. Uh, for those of you who are into apps, there's now a phone app available. I am not into apps, but I hear it's pretty good. Um, the, for those of us in Indiana, we have a Conservation Cropping Systems Initiative, which is um, kind of a partnership of NRCS and Purdue and uh, Soil and Water Conservation Districts and in the Department of Environmental Management uh, that has a lot of information on cover crops and no-till and a, a good website. And then, um, of course, the, the North Central Sustainable Ag Research and Education, or SARE, is another place for a lot of information about cover crops and sustainable ag. And let's see, Gary, I am at 22 minutes, so I think I didn't do too bad on my time. So hopefully there's uh, time for uh, questions or comments, if anybody has any. Yes? Why do, why do not more people use no-till? It's to be like, it's a lot less labor. You said you don't have to go in there and plow on discs. Why don't, why do they do it? Yeah, so the question is why don't most, why don't more people use um, no-till because it, it is less labor, there is less times across the field, there's less fuel usage. Uh, there is a learning curve with no-till um, and, and um, there are a lot of very detailed things that you have to pay attention to in order for, for no-till to work. So I would say no-till is adopted very broadly on sloping land because of the immediate obvious benefit of erosion control. On flat land where it's wetter, that's where it's a little bit more challenging because no-till can keep it wetter a little longer in the spring, and that's sometimes considered to be problematic. One of the suggestions is just to be a little more patient. Now, of course, this spring, you know, blew everything off the charts, but that's sometimes the issue. And if they go in too wet, then there's compaction, and then you can't fix it because you're not tilling. So, so there are some details in, in how to make it work. Um, but Gary might have some other thoughts on that. It is a little bit of a mystery to us still that there aren't more, a, a higher percentage of adoption. You know, probably, probably one of the things that presents a problem is weed control on uh, no-till. Uh, with a full width tillage, you have a certain suite of weeds that comes with it. And uh, most co-ops have a witch's brew and so forth that they can put on it, and it almost always controls weeds. But with no-till, every field is a little different because you've got, it, it germinates a different set of weeds. And so you've got to be able to recognize the weeds when they're this big and put the right stuff on. So it's, it requires a lot more management. Yes, you can end up ahead, but you've got to do a lot more thinking uh, in order to get that done. Yeah, higher level management. And that would be the same with cover crops. Higher level management, which some people are interested in and capable of, and others might not be capable of the degree of management that's needed on some ways. Yes, sir? Yes. I was very impressed by that one cover crop, that radish. Can you eat it? You can eat it, yes. And it's in Asian cuisine. Yes, you can eat it. All right. Uh, that would be an advantage for a cover crop if you could eat, the, eat it, right? Because then that would be a useful thing. And right, then it wouldn't be a cover crop, though. If you're going to go in and harvest the whole field, then it's no longer a cover crop. Then it's a second crop. But that there could be there could be still some reasons. So you just leave it in the ground, then? The you just leave it in the ground, yeah. Or put that, animals in the grave. Put animals in the grave. Yeah, or as Diane said, Although we could, you can eat a radish, but if you go and harvest it for us, then it's no longer a cover crop. But if you graze animals, 
then that would still be a cover crop. Yes, good point. Okay, yeah. What yeah. does cover crop seed cost per acre? Cover crop seed depends on, um, on how fancy you get, um, but it can be anywhere between uh, $15 to $35 an acre or more. But if you're, if you're using a simple a starter, you know, what we would talk about, well, we, we try to um, get, get people to keep it to $20 or less per acre for the seed. 15 is better. Um, 30, for $30 an acre, you ought to be able to get the seed and the seeding done. Yeah. Can you just throw the seed on top of the ground or does it have to be worked in? Right, so how can you seed it? Some, some species can be just broadcast seeded, so just spread it on the surface and you don't have to do anything. In particular, a lot of the, a lot of the smaller seeded um, items do okay with that. Um, you, so some will work that way, not all. Most will do better if you get it in the ground because you get soil seed contact, so you get more consistent ability of the soil to provide water for, you know, in, in division and germination of the seed. So each one is a little different, right? So I can't give you an overall answer on that. Yeah. Yes? I suppose you have the same answer, but this question has to be other than equipment. Because most corn and soybean farmers aren't going to have the type of equipment that you could either broadcast or, I don't know, what, what about equipment? It depends on the crop, is that the answer? Of course, everything on it depends. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So some, um, a lot of the uh, drilling is, is still probably the main thing, and most farmers still have a drill. Yeah. Uh, so you can drill most of these cover crops, and that way you get good soil seed contact. Um, if they don't have uh, broadcast, uh, it can actually be broadcast with dry fertilizer. That is another way to seed some of the cover crops. So it, in fact, that saves a trip, right? If, if they've got, uh, if the co-op's doing it or, or something else. A, a number of farmers have these things that are called vertical till, and so they can, they can do it that way as well. I don't know if I fully answered it, but yeah, equipment is, equipment for seeding after harvest, I don't think is the main, is the main issue, yeah. You need to tell these people what vertical tillage and yes. drilling is. Okay, well, I, I see a lot of, okay, I see a lot of ag faces in here that I recognize, but you're right that not everybody in here is ag. So, um, so drilling is just uh, an implement that cuts the surface a little bit and gets the seed into the soil. Um, and so that way the seed is into the soil um, as opposed to sitting on top. Because if it's sitting on top, like if you're planting your garden, if you get just the right rain at just the right time, then um, it'll it'll germinate and it'll grow. Um, if you don't, uh, then it'll sit there and the birds will eat it, or it'll germinate and then it'll die because of lack of water. And uh, yeah, vertical till definitely. Vertical till is a a modern new word for a disc. <laughs> I have a couple of colleagues who say they wish they had thought about that, that, that they invent a tool that the manufacturers claim it doesn't do much to the soil, and then they sell it for thousands and thousands of dollars. But you may, you probably sell a vertical till machine, so it probably just insulted you. But no. Okay, all right, thank you. Vertical till is something that, so it's a big blade and it cuts, it, it basically uh, uh, di uh, discs, yeah, how do I describe a disc? It cuts. It cuts the soil up and it mixes residue into the soil, um, and so it disturbs the soil and allows the seed to be in contact with the soil. That's the key thing about whether that whether you actually get it get it to germinate is does the seed in the soil have enough contact that the seed can germinate? And if it just sits on the top and it's bone dry, um, then there's nothing to allow it to germinate. Okay. Well, thanks very much.